Thanks everyone for turning out. Uh, it's always always thrilling to be the very last session of the conference. So uh, I appreciate everyone coming along today. Uh, perhaps many of you were at the, the gala dinner last night, so you've done even better to get here for the final morning of the conference. Uh, I like to think that we're saving the best for last though, because the topic that we'll be talking about today is, is one that's absolutely critical for the industry. Uh, quick intro, my name is Nick Abberley. I'm from the Clean Energy Council here in Australia. I'm the Policy Director for Energy Generation and Storage. I just want to start by paying my respects to the Wurundjeri people as the traditional owners of the land that this conference is taking place on and extend that respect to any elders who are here today. Uh, the role that I've been playing at the Clean Energy Council, I've been leading this, our strategy on offshore wind, uh, as well as other onshore large-scale project development, everything from planning approvals, environmental assessments, community engagement, social license, and all of those things that the industry has been dealing with for onshore projects is also very relevant to, to offshore projects. And a lot of that is what we're gonna be talking about today. I wanna start just by like flagging the scale of change that is coming in the energy transition. I mean, this has been talked about a bunch throughout the conference, but you know, in, in Australia, we're talking about 10,000 kilometers of transmission lines, which is an awful lot of transmission lines. Globally, I've seen estimates around for offshore wind of 600 to 2,000 gigawatts of offshore wind expected by 2050. Uh, my simple maths tells me that that's somewhere around 60 to 80,000 turbines around the coasts and seas around the world. Uh, and if you divide through by the 27 years we have until 2050, that's, that's 2,500 turbines installed every year from now until then, which uh, seems like a lot. There's, there's a lot to do, and it's going to create an enormous change in, in our landscapes and, and for our communities. And perhaps as a result of what we've seen already onshore and, and what we're seeing offshore in other jurisdictions as well, we're seeing more opposition to renewable energy projects. And I think that's for a few reasons. I mean, part of it is we uh, just have more projects, right? Like the, the industry onshore and offshore is expanding all around the world. And that means that you know, more communities uh, are being affected by renewables. And that just means there's more opportunity for projects to come across people who, who simply don't like them or who have concerns about them. I think another reason is that you know, many of the easiest sites have been taken uh, in, in a lot of places and it leads to new project developments occurring in areas where there are more constraints that might lead to local concerns. You know, and some people say, well, just, just put all the, the turbines and the panels a long way away, put them in the desert, put them in the ocean. Of course, that ignores the fact that you know, you'd just need enormous, you would need even more transmission to connect them, and it ignores the fact that those areas also have sensitivities that, that need to be addressed. In terms of community engagement, I mean, different countries and different cultures will have different approaches to this, but I think at a higher level, it's fair to say that uh, the more community support you have, the better the long-term prospects for your projects and for your industry as a whole. When we see problems with big infrastructure projects around the world, whether it's Duke and Gorge here in Australia or the Samarco Dam collapse in Brazil, you, know, you can see the impacts on communities and on environments that can happen when things go wrong uh, and on companies, you know, companies really do pay the price for, for not listening and not doing things properly. Uh, this is why it's important to work with communities, not against communities, and to ensure that those communities where we are building our projects or, or where there are transmission lines, we need to ensure that they are seeing the benefits of the energy transition, not merely dealing with the impacts while those of us in the cities can enjoy our renewable energy. The question is, how do we do this uh, and how do we do all this while balancing it against the, the pace of change that we need to see in order to adequately deal with the climate crisis? So just a small topic to deal with on the last day of the conference. Again, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, we have three wonderful panelists joining me on stage to, to talk about this. It was, I think, billed as a fireside chat. Uh, we don't quite have the whiskey and the fire, but we'll We'll do our best to, to uh, emulate the, the, the spirit of a, a free-flowing discussion around a, a range of the issues I've just touched on. 
So to introduce our panel, uh, I'll start from closest to me and, and move away. Uh, Josh Pearl is the General Manager of Energy Transition at Iberdrola Australia, where he works on the company's social, environmental uh, and economic uh, impacts as part of the Australian energy transition. Uh, before this, Josh has had a series of roles in corporate advisory, in the public sector and political advisory. Uh, the, the last of those as, as senior advisor and, and chief of staff to the New South Wales Treasurer uh, and as lead economic and infrastructure advisor to the New South Wales Premier. So that's a really interesting perspective on how some of these uh, social licence and community issues play out at, at a political perspective. Uh, next is Nam Kwok, who is the development manager at Skybourne Renewables. Nam has over 18 years experience in the energy sector with a range of roles from working at uh, turbine OEMs, uh, working at Gen Taylors in Australia, fund management, uh, as well as specialist technical consultancy, so really looking at all different parts of the puzzle. He's worked uh, in three different continents and has been involved in all stages of project development from origination through to financial close. So again, a really, breadth, really great breadth of uh, perspectives to bring to this discussion. Uh, and absolutely last but not least, Naomi Campbell is co-founder and development director at Energize Renewables. Uh, this is a, an, a business providing end-to-end -end consultancy services to developers, investors, and other stakeholders in the offshore wind industry throughout Australia and the Pacific. Uh, Naomi has worked for over 20 years across all sides of the table on the energy transition developer, regulator, consultant, independent business operator. Uh, 13 years of that in offshore wind, including four as development director at Australia's first offshore wind project, Star of the South. Uh, so without further ado, I will go join my panelists over here. I'll take this iPad, which hopefully won't drop. Cool. All right, seamless segue to the handheld microphone. So I'll just get things started with a, you know, just some, some, some easy opening questions. We'll start with a few softballs before we get into the spicier questions. Uh, I'll start with you, Josh. What, what do you see as some of the top issues that the industry needs to address when it comes to uh, building support amongst coastal communities for offshore wind? Um, I, I suppose when I think of how you build um, community support more generally, you, you sort of have to, I always think you break it down into to two parts. The first is um, the community has to understand the project need. Um, and so one, and then two, they've got to understand or feel confident that there are a range of benefits that they're, they're there to participate in. So I suppose in terms of um, the coastal communities and understanding the project need, what's really important is, is um, why offshore wind in my community, why um, offshore wind and not onshore wind, why offshore wind and not, and not, and not solar, for example. Um, I think in Victoria they've done a really good job. They've, they've, they've prosecuted that business case. They've really um, been clear in, term, in the implementation reports around what they're trying to achieve, why it needs to be done, um, and, and how they're trying to achieve it. The other areas around Australia where we've, we're looking at offshore wind, they've, they've, got, the, they've got a good present there in Victoria. Um, so I think thinking about that and, and being able to really articulate the project needs is important. And then in the benefits, um, it's articulating what type of business opportunities, what type of job opportunities, and then actually realising them. Those, those first few projects are going to be really important in terms of um, achieving, some of those, uh, achieving some of those positive outcomes. Yeah, I mean, that, that point around actually realising the benefits is something I want to come to a little bit later on. Um, Naomi, you, you've had a lot of time in the offshore wind sector. You've been involved in the delivery of, I think, 3.2 gigawatts of, of offshore wind projects. Um, how, how have you seen that, like, in your, your very personal and real experience of delivering these projects? What are the, what are the issues that you see um, come up that, that communities are consistently interested in knowing about? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think in my time, it's been the case that things have evolved in terms of you know community's concern 
when something is very new and a new technology that uh, you know they're not familiar with, um, the questions are often you know sort of um, based, I would say, out of uh, fear of the unknown. So the issues themselves can sometimes be very broad, um, and things that you, as a developer, you know, wouldn't maybe necessarily see yourself, but you have to approach it in such a way that you're prepared to listen to the concerns, and then you know come back with answers to those questions if you can, and obviously in ways that are as robust as possible. Um, so, you know, to begin with, there was in the UK questions around sort of, you know, health impacts of wind turbines. You know, that was something that uh, was not uncommon, even though they were out at sea. Um, impacts on the fishes, obviously. You know, people who are actually using the offshore space. Um, navigation and, you know, uh, aviation, that was also a big concern because uh, often, similar to Australia, airports are located, you know, close to uh, cities which are often on coasts <laughs> and also you have the military, um, you know, sort of infrastructure in and around those areas too. Um, but then as things have developed, those issues have kind of gone beyond that now. They're sort of into more of the space around sort of how uh, the techniques of installation, for example, um, could have impacts on uh, marine fauna, and then what you could do as an alternative to something that's traditional, or was traditional, you know, say 15 years ago when the first commercial projects got deployed. Um, and I think you'll see that the journey that the communities go on is one where they will start from a position of, you know, we don't know and therefore, you know, we are very concerned by a very large range of things to hopefully through um, best practice and um, consistent communications and, and engagement and taking them on the journey and being prepared to listen and provide those answers that the issues will start to crystallize and then you'll see what are the big ones that really, you know, people want to know, um, you know, are issues that they can see resolution to that would satisfy them in a way that they're therefore not going to put an objection in or even if they did at that point, you know, they could see that you've, you've done your best to try and overcome those issues. Yeah, I think that point you made around the fear of the unknown is something that's really interesting. And um, uh, if people haven't looked at it, I mean, it doesn't deal with offshore wind in particular because we don't have any operational offshore wind at the moment in Australia. But the, the annual report from the Australian Energy Infrastructure Commissioner is always a really interesting read on these issues. And they, so this, for those who, who aren't aware of the Commissioner's role, uh, his role is essentially to re receive and handle uh, complaints about, about uh, energy infrastructure projects, including generation projects. And in that annual report, they categorise the complaints that they receive. And I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's you know, the vast majority of the complaints that come in from the community are around proposed projects and there are very, very few complaints that come in about existing projects, which sort of goes to that point that, you know, when people don't know what something is, they can be very concerned about it, but kind of to your point as well, Josh, like, you know, the, articulating the need for the, for the project, uh, I think can go a long way to addressing those things. Um, Josh, um, sorry, Nam, I wanted to come to you. In terms of, you know, that, that question of fear of the unknown. So, you know, Skyborne is, is one of the developers who's kind of most out there in terms of the, the Southern Ocean region off the coast of Portland uh, in Western Victoria. How, you know, which means that you're, you and your colleagues are amongst the first people going to talk to people in those communities about offshore wind. Um, how, how have you encountered that, that process? Yeah, thanks, Nick. It's, um, I think it's a... Uh a tricky process, that, that fear of the unknown. Um, I think one of the, the key things that we've been focusing on is to um, demystify the unknown um, as best we can. And, and sometimes there are the unknown unknowns that, that come out of the process um, of engagement. Um, so some really practical ways we've been um, uh, trying to address that is really just to get out there 
um, and, and putting ourselves out there, making ourselves accessible, whether it be a, a drop-in information um, session for people to come in and, and ask those questions, um, or, or a bit more broad brush of um, webinars and um, newsletters and the like. And I think particularly point in time wise, now is quite critical to um, get that messaging out there that um, Josh spoke about and, and get um, information out there so that people can form an informed position. Um, actually took a call yesterday. Um, for those who don't know, the Southern Oceans consultation closes today. Please get your submissions in. <laughs> That's what I'm doing straight after this. Yeah, well, <laughs> I need to um, press send on, on my submission. Um, but I got a, a call from a Cape Bridgewater resident and um, he said a bunch of questions. Um, and it was an opportunity for me to give him, as, arm him with as many facts um, a, a, as he requires to form a position. A, and he's a local resident and um, that cluster for anyone who knows the area or the, the Pack Hydro projects, you know, they, they've been through a bit of a baptism of fire with onshore wind right at um, the Cape. So that community is um, quite familiar with working through the process. So I think um, really it's in, at this point in time, it's about getting the, the right information there to support the community and other stakeholders form an informed position that's not um, sort of skewed by misinformation or, or fear of the unknown. Yeah, there's one word that you use there which I really want to focus, I really want to draw some attention to is opportunity. And, you know, you said that you got some questions from a, from a, a resident and that was an opportunity for you. And I think that's really important that when you get questions or when you hear concerns from local communities, it's not a moment to get defensive. It's, it's a moment to go, this is great. Like, they want to know what's happening. This is an opportunity for me and my company to, to make the case, to make the, need, make the case for the need for the project and, and to articulate how, how, how it will play out. Um, uh, Naomi, uh, Star of the South has been held up a number of times as, like, you know, a really leading example of, uh, of community engagement done really well. Um, uh, really keen to hear any reflections you have on, on your time with that project and, and, you know, any, to the extent that there was any evolution in how Star of the South approached community engagement over time um, and any other sort of best practice, uh, I guess, lessons you've, you've seen from your experience around the world? So I think what is really important to understand with Star of the South is that prior to the um, investment from Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, who are Danish-based uh, company, so that the, effectively the Europeans coming and um, bringing their knowledge of offshore wind to Australia, was that there was a lot of pre-work done um, by the Australian founders, and they had prioritised their engagement with the community because they um, could see that for an offshore wind project on its own in Gippsland to work, that they really need to grow it from the grassroots and the support from the grassroots. So they brought on nation partners who are specialists in stakeholder um, engagement, and that's when uh, the CDO at Star of the South, Aaron Colden, became involved in the project. And so they were already embedded before um, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners joined. So when the Europeans, including myself, came across, um, it's fair to say it was a learning curve because the approach to stakeholder engagement, as Nick mentioned in his opening speech, is very different in, um, in countries in Europe. And the whole structure and approach, you know, is something that is um, pretty much very prescribed. You follow a formula, it pops out at the end, and then you submit a report, and then uh, either the, um, the determinating body says, that's all fine, thanks, green light, or, you know, no, you've got to go back and do more. But 
really it wasn't this sort of mentality of, oh, all right, we really need to work hard with the community to, to bring them on board. So it was um, really fortunate for me, and I think especially for CIP, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I would say that we had the Australians and we had nation partners and Aaron on board because that made a really big difference. And what also made a big difference was the investment those individuals had made in the community. They had gone to the communities, they spent time in the communities, they really cared about the people. And I think that really helped and they identified you know, who are the champions in the community in Gibsland? That it's really important that you, you know, reach out to, and if they are willing, they will come back and, and want to hear, you know, what's this opportunity, as, as um, Nick and Nam have said. Uh, so it was really good. We had some great members of the community. Unfortunately, um, one of them isn't, was going to present here today, Pat um, Simons from Yes to Renewables, and Wendy Farmer, if you've been to um, conferences, you might see her there. You know, there are strong representatives in the community who are the voices that talk to everybody every day. Um, so it was really important to identify them, bring them on board. As Josh mentioned, you know, you've got to give them the, the, the what's the need, give them the information. And then it was about growing from that base and making sure the messaging was really clear. Because for Star of the South, um, there was a license from the federal government to do exploration work, but you know it was exploration work. And so the actual messaging that Star of the South put out had gone to the Commonwealth government beforehand so that they could see it and get comfortable with it and make sure that it was in line with their messaging. So there was this whole kind of, I guess, interfaces that went round and round to ensure that whatever was being communicated uh, was being done so with total transparency. So no surprises was the kind of mantra. And then uh, the stakeholder team grew. They had an office in Yarram, so a local office, staffed by local people. Um, and also set up their community advisory group. So, you know, quite early on, there was discussion around whether that group should be um, small and targeted or bigger. And they settled with bigger and, yeah, a lot more administration, a lot more running around. And poor old Sarah Altman's done a, a great job in um, Star of the South to coordinate that and bring her team along. But, um, but a lot of effort, a lot of energy, um, and also sincerity which I think is, you know, what you're looking, well, what I would look for if I was looking for some stakeholder managers. I really want to know that they actually care and they're not going to leave people hanging if they've got a concern that really is making them very anxious. So um, it really was about proactive, um, you know, engagement, taking them on the journey, even when, you know, we're meeting as an uh, advisory group every six weeks, even if there wasn't anything to say. <laughs> you know, we'd find things to talk about. And also, we knew that the um, basis of the knowledge was coming from a place where it was really low to begin with. So it was important that we use those sessions to grow the knowledge in the local community through those members of the community advisory group. And there's a great chair that they've got there, Ian Gibson, who is also a, um, you know, a, a member of the community who's used to the Victorian system, so he understands panels, he understands the federal processes. Again, complicated things that actually, if you're not working in that space, it's really hard to get your head around if you're, you know, you've got a day job and a family, and you know, it's, it, it, you just want it to be easy, and you want to trust what the developer's saying. And that's where I come back to the sincerity and the dedication, uh, which is exactly what the stakeholder team in Star of the South did. So even in my experience across 13 years, Star of the South stands out, totally. Great. Uh, good to have a, such a leading example from, from our own shores. That's great. Um, I mean, a couple of things that I heard in, in there that, again, I just really want to pull out, like, Sincerity, I think, is is really critical. Uh, and another thing uh, that you mentioned sort of early on there was about prioritising it. Uh, sometimes when I'm talking with government agencies, for example, and they think, oh, well, you know, 
the big companies can do this, but maybe some of the smaller developers can't. And, and I say to them, no, it's, it's not about how big your company is, it's about what you prioritize. Um, and you know, companies that prioritize high quality community engagement will, will reap the benefit of, of doing that. Uh, and another thing that, I, that really resonated with me there was the, your comment about no surprises. Uh, and I think that's, that's a great um, mentality to take into community engagement, and I think that's a great mentality to take into any relationship that you're trying to build, right? And I remember uh, a, a panel discussion we had at a, a CEC conference earlier in the year where one of the speakers was saying, like, you know, social license is not like a driver's license. You don't just go and get it one day and go, hooray, I've got it, and then put it in your pocket never to use it again unless asked for it. Um, you know, social license is, it is maintaining a relationship and, and that means you have to approach it with the same sort of, uh, I guess, principles as you would any other relationship with anyone in your personal life. And so that, that idea of no surprises sort of really, really resonates with me. Uh, Josh, I'm gonna come to you in a sec on something else, uh, but just a reminder to folks in the audience that there is the app where you can submit your questions. Uh, I've got an iPad here that will send the questions from your phone to my iPad. So uh, if you want to ask any questions of the, of the panelists, um, just shoot them through on the app and, and I'll try to weave them into our fireside chat. Uh, Josh, how your role at, at Iberdrola is around like the, the social, environmental and economic aspects of the energy transition, which is a lot. Um, how can offshore wind best contribute to local and regional economic opportunities? Um, I suppose in terms of, um, I guess, the approach to start off with, it's, it's actually doing the research to understand what does what does offshore look like in terms of the, the supply chain and those um, employment opportunities? And then what does the local community look like um, in the areas of where you're doing the development? So I think for me, that's the kind of, that's the starting point, I suppose. So doing the research and then understanding the local community. Um, and then it's about uh, going through, okay, what, do you, what are our focus areas? Um, so if it's workforce, for example, what do we want to achieve with respect to training positions or with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion um, amongst workforce, both uh, as the developer side and then as we move further along the process on the, on the contractor side. So it's really kind of being really clear with, with what are your focus areas um, in terms of um, those key kind of community workforce First Nations um, uh, parts of it, and then where are those economic opportunities? Once you've got a sense of, of what your focus areas are and your targets, it's then about what are the initiatives? And that's kind of, um, I think Naomi had a, was, was, was talking to that in a, um, in a really neat way, which was how do you then create initiatives for people and local folk to work with your company, both as partners and then actually as employees? And then how do you look at the opportunities um, in creating different, um, different business opportunities for, um, for local businesses? In offshore, it's, it's, they're mega projects. So it's a lot of the businesses in the area aren't scoped up to be able to participate. So, you know, things, and I think the industry will, is, well, the industry is already thinking about it. I think it will progress as, as, the, as, as we progress towards um, construction. But it's, what, is the, what are the different types of support um, to help the um, businesses scope up to get prepared to be able to tender on these projects or, or different parts of the project? Um, and then how do, you, how do you chunk down your um, different parts of your procurement services so they can bid on it. And it need not be the really technical side of the, the work either. It's, you know, even, even things as Naomi mentioned, employing local, um, employing local community and stakeholder managers, employing uh, local catering companies. So it, it's really understanding what that supply chain and value chain looks like. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, there's, there's obviously a lot of very uh, technical and specific offshore wind related work, right? Like not everyone out in, in a coastal community is a 
you know, going to be able to assemble <laughs> turbines out in the ocean. Um, but there's still that opportunity for all sorts of local businesses because you're going to have a construction force of hundreds of hundreds of people there for, you know, in a, when, we, when we look at how the, the offshore areas are playing out in Australia, you're going to have a number of projects in a given area or, you know, coming out of certain ports. Uh, and so those, like you said, building up uh, the capability within those local areas is, is definitely an opportunity. Um, I want to talk about how this is different from onshore wind. So, um, I mean, you, you talked a bit there, Josh, about uh, lo like local supply chain and job creation, and I think a lot of that is, is very similar in terms of how we can work with onshore communities, uh, sorry, with communities where there is onshore wind or, or, or solar, but uh, there is still some uniqueness here, right? Like, so one of the ways that uh, the, the communities can be really involved in, in uh, the benefits of the project, yes, like the, the local benefits of, of having more employment and, and more economic activity is all great, um, but we see in a lot of onshore projects we have benefit sharing schemes, uh, you know, landholders get certain payments, neighbours get certain payments, but out in the ocean, you know, there aren't, there aren't landholders or, or, or neighbours. How, um, maybe Nam or, or Naomi, you know, any thoughts on how offshore wind projects can approach that type of benefit sharing uh, element that, that goes beyond, um, you know, job creation and, and economic activity? I might jump in there, Naomi. Um, look, it is different to, to onshore wind. Uh, just the physicality of it is different. The the scale of it is different. Um, and look, we're all neighbours as part of it. It's it's you don't have a specific neighbourhood agreement as you might on a onshore wind farm project because the whole community <laughs> effectively is the neighbour. Um, and this is something that we've been turning our mind to at Skyborn. You know, what's um, a, a really good or practical model to, to think about community benefits. I think the first thing I'll say is, um, what's the community thing? So um, we're casting a net out to, to understand from the community, what do you feel, what do you think is um, relevant to you and, and your community? Um, and also to our traditional owner partners, you know, how, how do you see this um, impacting your community? Um, uh, a lens that I would like to take in that differentiation of onshore, offshore is the, the clusterization of these projects. You know, we're all sort of um, pigeonholed into a sandpit of a zone, and it, it actually, to me, offers the opportunity for some efficiency with um, benefit sharing and how it, it may be um, practically administered. So it could be a case of rather than, you know, five proponents in a, in a cluster having five different conversations with the community, which may get quite exhausting um, and um, fatiguing. I think the opportunity does exist uh, perhaps down the track as more clarity of which of the proponents are license holders um, and that opportunity for collaboration around maybe um, a, uh, a fund that's administered or a, um, a program that's administered by this cluster as opposed to individual proponents. Um, it, it is certainly a way that if I look at other models, um, the French model ha has worked in that regard where actually the LGA, um, the, the, the city shire, um, is the administer of the, the program. Um, and that might be a practical um, level of, of government to support something like that. And, and the proponents um, work into that pool, so more of a, a pool approach. But coming back to my first point, I think it's, it's really important to, to ask and listen to um, what uh, the community's thoughts are and how, how they can um, benefit and, and uh, optimise the process. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, do you want to add something? Yeah, maybe a reflection from the UK, uh, where, if you like, the scale of offshore wind really grew very, very quickly. So to put it into perspective, the UK was the biggest offshore wind market um, and has only just recently been eclipsed by China. 
Um, but in the UK, government's main focus when things were getting quite large was on limiting liabilities. So stuff like, you know, encouraging, well, compelling developers to have decommissioning plans and, you know, managing their risk. And so the focus in terms of what government did in terms of putting obligations on developers wasn't really focused that much on community. It was more about limiting the risk and the liability for the UK uh, PLC and, and obviously taxpayers in the UK. So I think what you saw in the UK was a bit of a gap really between these very large commercial projects being proposed and benefits filtering back into the community. And the, the leases or the licenses that you'd compare them to here, they, they had a term at that point of five years. That's quite a long time for a community to be taking a lot in terms of, you know, you wanting to engage, you asking for their time, you, you know, you're putting a lot of questions their way. Um, but not necessarily um, for them to actually feel or see tangible benefits. And in Australia, that's going to be a period of up to seven years. So I would, in, in terms of taking learnings from the UK, look at the feasibility phase and say to myself, well, what, what can we do now? You know, what, what are we... You know, what could we practically do that would start to demonstrate benefits um, and Josh obviously picked up an, on the use of local employees in the development phase, you know, use of local businesses in the development phase. Who do you get to you know, print your uh, application if you decide you need to print it? You know, who are you using for your milk? Because you know, if it's Gibsland, you get Gibson milk, right? Um, they're the best cows. Uh, but yeah, you, you are, um, I think, mindset-wise, looking at for benefits very early on, even though they might be small, it's signs to the community that you are actually, you know, serious. You know, you're not just making very big gestures and, um, you know, sort of showing that there will be something. Just hold on. You know, I think um, people really want to see, you know, with their own eyes that you mean what you're saying. And I don't think as developers um, should be necessarily waiting for government, is what I'm also saying, to compel them to do something. I think if you are um, a developer who's really uh, committed to Australia and committed to developing these projects, then I'd encourage every developer to see it as an opportunity to do something really different here. And one way of doing that is not waiting for government to make uh, statements that will mean that you'll need to do something. You know, do it because it's the right thing to do. I want to touch on, I want to come to a point that you sort of started flagging this NAM in, in your comments just before around um, like consultation fatigue. Uh, and and you, this sort of came up in the context of, you know, if you're, the, the idea of like pooling benefit sharing type schemes or community contributions rather than having you know, four or five projects from the same area, each doing their own thing, and whoop, losing my iPad, um, and all trying to engage the community on, on how best to, to use those contributions. Another thing where there's obviously a risk of uh, consultation fatigue with communities is just around the projects themselves. Uh, and, you know, in the, the way offshore wind is, is f unfolding, I suppose, in Australia is that we have area declarations, once an area is declared, there's a period for, for feasibility license applications, and then, you know, once we get feasibility licenses, then that's sort of those are the projects that, that then sort of go through towards commercial licenses. In the Gippsland area, which is the only one where applications have closed so far, we've got 37 feasibility license applications. I'm pretty sure the community does not want to be having 37 different developers knocking on their door, wanting to tell them about their project, when I think we all know 37 projects aren't going to go ahead. Um, how, how do we deal with this? Uh, you know, I don't think there's even 37 publicly announced projects in Gippsland. Uh, so there's, I think there's this real tension between, and I'm going to throw this to all of you, I don't know why I'm looking at NAM all the time, but. Um, I think there's this real tension between this principle that, that the renewable energy industry has, has heard so often of, like, engage early, B, 
because that's when you need to be engaging with communities. There's a tension between that and consultation fatigue when we know that not all of the projects that have gone for feasibility licenses are going to get them. So there's a, there's a really interesting dynamic that we need to, to manage here. So who would like to have something to say about that? I'll volunteer. <laughs> I volunteer as tribute. And, on, and um, look, I, I'll just give you the, the, the Skyborne approach um, that, that we've been taking. And um, I think Naomi hit the, the nail on the head um, earlier around her words, um, being genuine, building trust and um, transparency. So I think they are absolutely key elements to try to balance that. And we've been quite active and vocal um, in the, the community, the, the Southern Ocean Zone particularly. Um, but one thing we, we very much do focus on is being transparent. Um, sometimes that fear of the unknown, you know, the, the immediate apprehension can be, oh gosh, when are you gonna build the project? Um, so you're already approved and yada, yada, yada. Well actually, we, we then have to take the time to, um, and patience to, to step them through the process. Um, I've been using this current window as a great opportunity to do that, to say, look, this is a great opportunity for you and as the community and stakeholders to influence the, the, the process. And this is what the process looks like. The, the minister has to declare the zone. Then as a proponent, um, we have to competitively um, uh, compete for and then effectively win a feasibly license to study the project and then, if it all stacks up, the project will be viable, and then we'll build the project. And that's a, you know, a 10-year horizon. I think getting that transparency across, um, and, and hey, the, the, the factor of the matter is, this could be, or it could not be, um, a project that gets built. We just have to be very transparent about that, um, give the stakeholders an understanding of some of the variables and complexities that are involved. And I think that does take away um, the apprehension and, and certainly the misconception um, that, <laughs> and media doesn't help, but um, you know, it's not every project that applies will be um, built. That's just a, a reality. So um, I think that's a strong part of it, um, to be present, um, accessible, to support them in their considerations, um, uh, to unpack some of their concerns. Um, but also to be very transparent around just the, the, the practicalities of, of um, getting an offshore wind farm off the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, I've got a, there's a question from, the, from the, chat, the app that's come through which sort of links to this, but if Josh or Naomi, if you want to add anything to that. Uh, I'll just add really quickly, I, I almost see Gippsland as a sort of a special case in this. It's the first, in terms of what you're talking about. It's the with the, well, I, I like it's, to call it the first pancake. It's the, it's the first one. The first pancake never quite works, but for some reason... It's but, still really tasty. Yeah, you know? the mixture is the same, and yeah. <laughs> and, and so I think, like, having, you know, 37, um, 37 applicants in there, having a bunch of those um, applicants in the community, engaged with the community, it's, there is a certain amount of um, consultation fatigue that is part of that. At the same time, it's almost, almost feel like that's, that's kind of fine. Um, as licenses are awarded, that will obviously change as well. Um, but for the subsequent zones, I'm not sure that the community will be of the same accord or if I'm federal government, I necessarily, I don't necessarily want, or state government, by the way, I don't necessarily want 30 or 40 um, proponents talking to, doing door knocks, talking to community, saying good stuff and being really open about it, but slightly different messages. Mm. Um, now, if that's the case, then government needs to be on the front foot making those um, and, 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 and leading some of that. Um, you know, that's a, that's a consideration. Um, and then I guess as part of that is how much do they want, and this is a federal government question, how much does the federal government want uh, proponents and applicants in the community at the same time as bidding on on licenses. Now, in in, a, in infrastructure in different in different areas, the government will say 
don't talk to the community. Why are you out there sort of, um, you know, kind of creating this while we're um, trying to keep on message around a new toll road that's 30 kilometres through the CBD in Sydney that a whole bunch of people hate? Guys, we don't want you talking to the community. Now, again, this, it's, it's going to be horses for courses. I think Gippsland was kind of fine. You know, I, I don't think that was a, a bad outcome. Um, and maybe all of the other regions will be the same in terms of having the proponents in there early um, and then, you know, after licence applications, people will drift away and the ones that have the licences will be, will be leading the charge. Um, but it's one thing that I, if I'm government and I'm industry as well, I want to be monitoring that because if it's not quite working or it's look like it's not working, you want to change a, change to a different tact. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the question that's come through from the app is how will various proponents of offshore wind work together to coordinate messaging to the community such that there's consistency rather than misinformation being played off between each other? And I think that sort of goes... I mean, I think you've sort of partly answered that already in terms of, like, that, uh, that, that coordination and um, having... Uh, well, yeah, anyway, any, anyone want to add to that? Maybe I'll say, because it's a great question, and it's an obvious question, right? You know, so, okay, why aren't, you, why aren't they all working together and being consistent? And I think what I would say in terms of what you need to understand at this point in time is that the environment in which people are in is un uncertain, unclear. Things, you know, are volatile, right, in terms of... Uh, the direction of travel, you don't know whether you're going to get a licence, whether you're not, you know, the way the government are, are effectively um, evaluating their licence applications in terms of, yes, there's a process, but, um, you know, for, for reasons that I, you know, I can understand, I, I can see why they're not going down into the minutiae of detail as to how they'll judge, um, you know, developers. But... The, on the developer side, it's also hard, right? Because they can see, and you can see, I think this week I read that um, South Australian government are going to send a very strongly worded letter to um, the Commonwealth government on the prospect of having offshore wind over the South Australian border and affecting their rock lobster, um, you know, communities there. Uh, so you're seeing that when, in the absence, I guess, of um, uh, clarity on what the um, what may be out in the water, and in, in terms of actually, the, you know, the developments that can be, uh, you know, materialised. Without that information, and I've been to Commonwealth um, sessions that they run with the community, and there's a lot of representatives there, and that's fantastic. But they also just have a map, you know, which shows a very big area. Um, and if I was to see that, and I knew nothing, I would think to myself, is that going to be full of turbines? You know, blimey, I don't want that. Um, so I can see why this is getting, um, you know, sort of responses that are much more alarmist um, than perhaps they would be if, and uh, Josh mentioned Gibson, where you've had a proponent and an applicant like Star of the South working with the communities closely for five plus years. You know, they, they haven't got that response because they understand that, uh, you know, there will be projects within the area and it won't be completely covered in turbines. So um, I think, you know, in terms of what we're seeing, I think it's very hard because if you lined up 100 stakeholder managers and you said, right, what should I do? I bet you they would all give you a different response. So to kind of work your way in this environment where you're also then saying, well, should we all collaborate with uh, applicants who will have very different strategies, some like Skyborne are very out there, you know, they're promoting what they're doing. You've got others that are a bit quieter who have taken a strategy that they would rather have the certainty than uh, before they start communicating. So it's hard to even approach them in an environment where you are also in competition, right? Let's be, let's be um, you know, frank about that. So I think the collaboration will come and the, and the actual collaboration on approaching the community will come. It's just not something that I think is practical at this stage. 
Great, thanks. Um, and just because the question talked about uh, how will the offshore wind industry work together, I'm just going to use it as a quick plug for the Clean Energy Council's Offshore Wind Directorate. Uh, we have great meetings every six to eight weeks or so. Uh, if you're a CEC member, uh, make sure you're coming along to those. If you're not a CEC member, catch me afterwards. Um, having lots of good conversations in that group about uh, a very wide range of issues the industry needs to uh, work through collaboratively. We've been talking a lot about uh, like sort of the community as a, as, a, as a whole, and I think in many ways we're talking about sort of, I guess, residents of, of the community. Uh, I, I want to talk about a, a couple of specific um, groups that, are, that are, have very much have a stake in, in offshore wind. Uh, and there's a question in the chat here. Um, are there any global case studies for positive lessons learned with offshore wind and first peoples we can learn from? Uh, at a Clean Energy Council conference a couple of months ago, we had uh, the CEO of the, the traditional owner group in, in Gippsland who was saying that, you know, we don't want to be seen as stakeholders in your project. Like, we want to be seen as partners, uh, which I think was a really powerful message. But just anyone on the panel, any, any lessons or, or, or examples you're, you're aware of from overseas um, or, or here in, in terms of how best um, we can partner with, with First Nations people? There is one maybe that's emerging, uh, which is in New Zealand. So in New Zealand, there's a consortia looking at um, Taranaki. Um, and in New Zealand, they are, you know, uh, they are in terms of the Maori and, um, you know, uh, the, I guess, acknowledgement of their rights. Um, they are in a very different place to, to maybe where Australia is today. So the, um, the iwi, um, which are the, the Maori groups um, around New Zealand, have a, a lot more of, a, I guess, a, a stronger starting position in that they are held up within the, the constitution so that they aren't stakeholders. You know, they have a, a very different status. And you can see already in that consortia just how that changes um, the approach and uh, very early on, you know, the the actual process even of putting a, 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 a press release with an indication of where a project might be, that all had to go through iwi. And it was something that there was a lot of time spent, um, probably six months, getting to that place. And they wanted to see information. They wanted to you know, understand what was being proposed before they would endorse effectively by allowing these um, press releases to be made public with their, without them objecting. Um, so I would say actually there's a space where First Nations people and offshore wind hopefully are going to um, come into contact with each other in a way where there is a structure and an expectation that um, gives the First Nations people um, the status needed to then allow them to have that say. And then if you like, in terms of a model, New Zealand has models of how the iwi are effectively partners, and by that I mean equity partners in projects. And the, um, one of the funds that is supporting the Taranaki um, developments is NZ Super. And they are the national, you know, super for uh, for New Zealand, and they have a mandate to grow um, the super fund for all of New Zealanders. Uh, and they ESG is very very clear on that how they will do that. So for them, it's a it's a no brainer. If they're partnering with anyone, they're partnering because that partner, European or from wherever they may be, accept that from the start you are designing a partnership with the First Nations people. Uh, and on that. Yeah, I just had um, a couple of reference examples that I'll um, quickly um, walk through. One, um, uh, I'll start with Skybourn. And um, the, the notion of partnering with our traditional owners is um, front and centre. Um, you know, that we don't have a feasibility license yet. Uh, we've got a lot of work in front of us to do. But one of the things that we thought, let's tackle this head on, um, was around sea country. You know, I don't understand sea country. 
Um, I've done plenty of terrestrial cultural heritage, say HMPs, Alus and the like. Um, but I thought this is a field of study that let's um, learn it, understand the risks, and let's learn with the traditional owners. So we've been working with um, Gunit Mirring to get their inputs. Um, we've been learning ourselves, you know, how do you, where do you start understanding it? Um, and then um, sort of deploying that model into WA, we've got an interest in the, the Nilkilmbudja um, peoples, you know, similarly, um, like all the, the, the coastal um, traditional owners, um, have a very strong interest in, in, in sea country, and there's a whole lot of um, um, practical complexity to work through as well. There's models that you can build, there's um, um, terrestrial to sea country linkages, then there's a whole world of understanding um, cultural values, both tangible and intangible. But I think um, l learning together is one way, and the, the Neil and Widger in, in WA said, oh, we'd, we'd love to uh, get some insights into um, how do you study it um, from the modelling perspective and, and paleoarchaeology. So that's, I think, an example of where one can partner and, and shared learnings. Um, another one that I will quickly reference, um, not something that Skybond's doing, but something that I'm keeping a, an eye on and a watch on, is um, there's a fund called Octopus Desert Springs. Um, so that's focused in North Australia, and it's actually a 50-50 a JV. So I don't think there's any um, better example of practical partnering. Um, I'm sure there are, but um, you know, that is a very uh, literal partnership of... Um, uh, traditional owner land councils and uh, um, a developer and a fund to look at some of the opportunities and they're working on from you know, 10 megawatt opportunities in indigenous communities through to large utility scales. So I think that's a, a watch this space and, and hopefully they can learn through the process and, and have some, some learnings for industry to apply as well, more broadly. Yeah, I think that, that, that the Desert Springs one is a great example. Um, the, the Clean Energy Council is producing a, a guide. We're in the process of doing this in partnership with KPMG uh, on best practice, First Nations engagement, participation, and benefit sharing for renewable energy projects. Not specifically offshore wind, but all renewable energy. Uh, that process has been going really well. Um, our community engagement social license group, uh, working, social license working group, uh, ha has been really driving the, the creation of that. Um, and that will be coming out in October, November. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing that final guide, which will obviously be out publicly. Uh, and Naomi, we've just got one minute left, but um, it was interesting in your answer to hear about the First Nations status in the New Zealand constitution. Uh, and if only we had an opportunity in, say, six or so weeks to, to have a vote uh, about adequate recognition um, and opportunity for representation for our First Nations people in Australia in our constitution. Uh, so get a little political for a sec, but vote yes uh, on October 14th. Um, we are right on time, uh, so I'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to the last session. Uh, it always takes a special effort to get to the last session of a conference, so thank you for coming along. Hope you've enjoyed the discussion. Uh, big thank you to my panelists, Naomi, Nam, and Josh. Uh, if you can put your hands together for our panel. Thank you. Cool, and thank you everyone for coming to this summit. Uh, it's been a great event. Hope you've all learned something, made good connections, uh, and can now go off and uh, go forth and conquer and help Australia and, and the Asia Pacific uh, lead on, uh, on offshore wind and green hydrogen. Thanks very much.